Hey, this is Pastor Brad from Christ Redeemer Reformed Church here in Moreno Valley, and we are going through Ephesians as part of a summer reading program. So today I'm going to continue on with our recap. We've done chapter one. We've done the first 10 verses of chapter two. Now we're going to go ahead and do verses 11 through 16. So let's dive right in. Verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility." All right, at this point, let's remember where we've come from. Paul has made the argument of God's powerfulness to save before the foundation of the earth, that he would save us in time and raise us up with Christ in the heavenly places and give us an inheritance. He's also talked about how we are saved by grace through faith, that this is all a work of God in our lives. And now he's going to move on in verse 11, and he's going to start talking about the difference between two groups of people. There were the Jews and the Gentiles, and he's going to call them the uncircumcised, which is kind of a a term of derision, right? They're unclean and the circumcised. Let's dig in and read verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcised by what is called the circumcised, which is made in the flesh by hands. So it's important to point out here, again, the uncircumcision would have been unclean. These are two groups of people that would have hated each other. There's a lot of division with regard to the ceremonial law, which we'll get to. But what's important about saying that this is a circumcision which is made by hands is that the covenant sign that God gave the Jews was circumcision. The Jews would have thought that they were in covenant because of this physical sign, right? This is a circumcision that is done by hands. We are physically Jew. We are physically descendants of Abraham and heirs in that covenant promise. Moving on, verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant promise, having no hope and without God in this world. This is important to point out because Paul had just made the argument that this salvation that they now have is all a work of Christ. Once alienated, once separated from God, now brought near through the blood of Christ. And this passage will go on and say that, but we've kind of touched on that already in the previous verses. So it's important, again, to remember that, yes, the Gentiles were separated from Christ. Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. So this would have been, yes, alienated from citizenship in the country. So basically he's saying there there are people without land. There are people without promise. Israel had all this history of patriarchs, of covenant promises, and they had a land, and the Gentiles were not really included. There was ways for the Gentiles to be included in that but not to the extent that they would now be included in Christ. But the Gentiles at the time would have been looked down upon. These are essentially orphans. These are people without a home, people without a family. But remember what Paul had just told us in the previous verses again, that we have now been adopted in. We are now a people with a land. And that's not just Israel, though. That This is actually the entire globe. The world is ours to go take dominion over in the name of Christ. And we are a people with a father. We are adopted in now. They would have been a people without hope. And that's what he's saying, that you have no hope. You have no you have no heritage. You have no covenant promise, none of this stuff. You have no hope. But in Christ, now the argument he's making is, yes, you have hope. Moving on to verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Like we had read about in chapter 1, it is through the blood of Christ that we now draw near, that we have been justified, that we now have access to the Father. And this is where we're going to start getting into kind of the levels of seeing this scripture. There's levels to this. So it was through the blood that we now have access to the Father. It was through the blood that we are now justified and adopted into the family. And when Christ shed his blood and gave up his spirit on that cross, what happened? The veil in the temple was torn Those who were separated from God can now have access to God. So this is going to work on the vertical level. This is going to work vertically, and it's going to work horizontally, as you'll see as we press on. Verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one 
and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Let's keep noticing, like we have been in previous passages, that God is doing all this stuff. All this is work that God is doing. We didn't break down the wall. The Jews didn't break down the wall. In fact, there was hostility and it took God to break down this wall. But for he himself is our peace. Notice Paul's language. He's not saying it was your peace and then it was this other person's peace. No, he's including both the Jews and the Gentiles here. So he's showing you there is unity in Christ because of what Christ has done for you. There is unity not only between you and the Father, right? Because you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. So now you are near to the Father. So it's working vertically. But now by using all this us and our language, this inclusive language, Paul is saying you now have unity with each other. Unity with God, unity with each other. So it's working vertically, it's working horizontally. So that's that's a big part of this picture I want us to all see. Christ, our Prince of Peace, has broken down in his flesh. Wow, the poetry there. Because his flesh was broken. Christ was broken. The veil was broken, giving us access to the Father. And now the imagery of a, a broken body of Christ that is breaking down the dividing wall of hostility between God and us and these two people groups. It's beautiful. Honestly, it's very it's very poetic. This the, the imagery is amazing because yes, it's talking about something that's spiritual that is happening. And yet it's also talking about something very physical. What do I mean by this is very physical? Obviously, two groups of people, but literally in the temple at this time, there would have been probably a waist high wall. There was a a court where the Gentiles could have been. And then there was the inner courts where no Gentile was allowed to go. So they were literally divided by a wall. So again, to keep pushing this, Christ has broken down the boundary between us and the Father, breaking his body, tearing the veil, and literally breaking down the wall in terms of the things that divide the Jews and the Gentiles because he keeps using this us language. So he's saying that this wall of hostility no longer exists. There's another aspect that I want to touch on here, and that is in Adam, we all fell. In Adam came division, came hostility. But in Christ, the better Adam came unity, came peace. The broken body of the better Adam has unbroken the world, if that makes sense. In the one Adam, division and death In the better Adam, death bringing unity and life. Let's again press on, noticing that there's temple language at use here. Verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. So again, he's just continuing to press that the things that divided the Gentiles and the Jews, these ordinances have now been abolished. Christ has fulfilled these ordinances by his blood. Because God hated sin so much, the Jews had to go through sacrifice after sacrifice. And these ordinances were a point of tension for the Jew and the Gentile. Praise God that Christ is that final ultimate sacrifice that has done away with the need of any other sacrifice once for all, uniting both Jew and Gentile, uniting humanity to the Father. Again, remember this is working vertically, this is working horizontally. And as it goes on, by doing this, he has made one new man in place of the two. So making peace. Again, the broken body of Christ creates unity. The veil torn in two, creates one new humanity. Do you see the beauty of God's imagery here? It gets even better. Verse 16, and might reconcile us both to God, right? Us both, again, this inclusive language of the Jew and the Gentile, to God in one body through the cross. Two people, one body in the cross, crucified, right? Killed, thereby killing hostility. You see, the killing of Christ killed the hostility between the Jew and the Gentile and brings unity not only between us and the Father, but unity with one another. So here's what we get from this church is that, yes, we were once far off, but Christ by his blood has made us children of promise, given us hope in this world. Not just in a small piece of land, but he's given us hope in this world because he has ascended, remember, as we read earlier. He has ascended and he is king over all. It's not about this little piece of land. It is now global. The Great Commission is global. Notice Paul is saying this world, right? Because this world matters. Unlike what a lot of preachers have preached, that this world doesn't matter. It's going to get worse and burn and there's just a better thing to come. While we would agree that, yes, there is a greater glory to come, This world matters because this is the world that Christ will come and renew. 
Christ is currently reconciling this world and footstooling his enemies to himself. So absolutely, this world matters. And that should change the way you do every aspect of life because Christ cares about you and this world and your family and the way you lead your family, the way you disciple your children, moms, the way you're cleaning the house, how you beautify the home, how you do the dishes, dad, how you change the oil. All of these things matter because this world matters and we can have hope in this world. And so we who were once far off, we now have a land. We now have a promise. We now have an inheritance. We are no longer orphans, but are united to our heavenly father and thus united to one another in Christ. We are one body, one bride in the world and Christ is our head. Remember, remember that language. We are the body. Christ is our head. There's no disunity in the head. Therefore, the body is united. The temple that once had a dividing wall of hostility is no more. We are now the living stones, the ones in whom the spirit now dwells. So let us go proclaim the gospel and be peacemakers. And just as God has reconciled us to himself, let us be a people of reconciliation here on earth. All right, I'm going to stop here. But there's plenty to say about this. You can go a lot deeper into it, and I hope you do in your own study and in your own groups. As always, if you have any questions, please come ask me on a Sunday morning. God bless y'all. Hope it's been edifying.